Fiery Dweevo. Oh, here we go. Mandarachnia napalmans, Dweevo family. Members of the Dweevo family are known for carrying objects of astounding size on their backs, then mimicking them. This is true. They can carry treasures as well as enemy bugs. The Fiery Dweevo is one species in this family. Generally, this is a very gentle insect that feeds on grass nectars, but when faced with danger, the Fiery Dweevo ignites flammable internal gases, juts out its jaw, and spews scorching flames. As this clearly makes it a rather dangerous insect, it is best not to linger directly in front of it. Yeah, because otherwise you'll get cooked. Oh my god, the worst of them all. A no Dweevo, Mandarachnia Volticula, Dweevo family. Members of the Dweevo family are known for carrying objects of astounding size on their backs and mimicking them. The Anole Dweevil is one species in this family. They seem to have no particular preference for which objects they carry on their backs, as they will carry anything they can lift. That has been proven. And also, we talked about this already. They boast an internal organ that generates electrical charges, which the Anole Dweevil releases when it senses danger. And that's what makes them ever so dangerous. The most dangerous amongst all the other Dweevils. Well, actually, there's another one coming up, but... I don't know, we'll see. We'll make a comparison. Maybe. Caustic Dweevil. Mandarachnia sophronet, Dweevil family. The Caustic Dweevil is one member of an insect family known for mimicking objects by carrying them on their backs. We've covered this already. Several points of differentiation with other members of the species have been confirmed, such as body color and behavioral patterns, but none of these suggest major deviations in the creature's genetic structure. This makes it clear that it is a relative of the family. When attacked by enemies, the caustic dweevil spits out bodily fluids in response. Again, I'm pretty sure that's water. Spacesuits corrode and oxidize when they come in contact with this highly acidic liquid. Wait, if that's true, then whenever Olimar and Louie carelessly walk in front of it whenever it senses danger, or is in danger, why is it that they don't take damage? That's something I don't get. Maybe I'm missing something here. It's a mystery. Munge Dweevil. Mandarachnia pungetis, Dweevil family. The Munge Dweevil is one member of an insect family known for mimicking objects by carrying them on their backs. Again, this was stated. These insects often carry the carcasses of other life forms on their backs, but apparently this is not for the purpose of transporting them as food, but instead is another example of their mimic behavior. The Munge Dweevil produces two different chemical compounds within its body, which form poisonous gas when mixed and expelled. This gas is used only for self-defense. I wonder what the two chemical compounds are. Now I'm really curious. Oh god. Volatile Dweevil, Mandarachnia Explodus, Dweevil family. The Volatile Dweevil is one member of an insect family known for mimicking objects by carrying them on their backs. Please let this be the final time that we discussed this. The Dweevil family exhibits a most unusual characteristic whereby the creature's behavioral patterns actually change based upon the object the creature carries on its back. The Volatile Dweevil has one of the most potent attacks of all species within the Dweevil family, due to its habit of carrying explosive devices. Approach with caution and or body armor. Yeah, so basically it gets a bomb rock on top of its back and when any creature gets close to it, it starts to activate the bomb rock, self-destructs, and then basically just commits suicide. That's uh... Well, all I can say is, take that what you will, guys. Actually, come to think of it, when I compare the Anole Dweevil and the Volto Dweevil, it's hard to determine which one is the more deadly. I mean, volatile dweevils are easy to avoid altogether. The same for anole dweevils, but if you're careless, then it'll basically generate an electric field in which any Pikmin that aren't yellow will be electrocuted to death. I still say that the anole dweevil is the most deadly dweevil member. And volatile dweevil would definitely be the second most dangerous. Toady Boyster. Molluscid Minionicus, Mollusking family. This species of creature has yet to fully evolve from shell mollusk to the more advanced bloister. Compared to the bloister, this creature is significantly smaller. The fact that its mandibles do not protrude as significantly as the ranging bloister is due in part to the fact that it that like most mollusks, its vital organs are located deep within the creature's carapace. 
moving on. It's still very interesting. Yellow Wallywog, Amphicarus Frodendum, Amphituber family, hate you so much. This magnific big va. This magnificent specimen has the brightest gold coloration and the greatest number of lateral spots of any member in the Amphituber family. This species seems to have lost some swimming proficiency with the evolutionary adaptation that granted it greater jumping ability. The Amphituber inhabits aquatic shallows and shows an instinctive drive to jump upon and squash smaller creatures. What kind of instinct is that? A creature just wants to jump on top of another creature? I wonder. Wallywog, Amphicarus albino, Amphituber family. It is believed that juvenile Wallywogs were once carried by underground current into caverns where they thrived in the dark habitat. This troglodytic species of Wallywog's coloration results from generations of cave dwelling and lack of sunlight. Compared to differences between the size and shape of this Wallywog and other species are thought to be the result of natural selection at work, choosing traits better suited to life in a subterranean environment. I know how you feel, dude. I know how you feel. You have to live your life indoors. Pretty sure this goes the same for... What do they call those people? Introverts? Introverts, that's it. And I myself am an introvert. I'll just leave it at that. Wogpo, Amphicarus frodendum, Amphituber family. The Wogpog spawns in early spring, laying its eggs on low hanging tree branches and shrubs growing in or near lakes and ponds. Such unorthodox amphibious behavior is a defense mechanism, protecting the eggs from predation by blue pigmen and water dumpos. Guys, keep away from the shore. The Wallywogs while hopping near the shoreline in early spring is thought to be a method of driving predators away from the Wogpo eggs. Oh, I see. So there is a reason why they flop around like that. It's just to protect their young. Very motherlike, if we can call it that. Let's move on. Lapis Lazuli Candy Pop Bud, Flora Cob Baltium, candy pot family. No matter what color pigment is tossed into the bosom of this flower, it spits out the same number of blue pigment. This family of plant boasts soft fleshy leaves, the sinewy tendrils of which allow the flower to open and close repeatedly over the course of a day. Fascinating. Crimson candy pot bud, Flora refugia, candy pot family. No matter what color pigment is tossed into the bosom of this flower, it spits out the same number of red pigment seeds. The pigment, the candy pop flowers, and the pigment onions are not easily explained by current theories of the xenobotanical sciences, and thus have not been appropriately studied and classified. Golden candy pop bud. Fora aromia, candy pop family. No matter what color pigment is tossed into the bosom of this flower, it spits out the same number of yellow pigment seeds. Current research has yet to produce any theories as to precisely what kind of interaction causes the pigment to change color to match the color of this flower's petals. Yeah, I find that rather interesting myself. The many mysteries of this planet, whatever this planet is, I'm pretty sure we all know what it is by now. Violet Candy Pop Bud, Flora Ponicius, Candy Pop Family. Research from our most recent expedition has confirmed the presence of candy pop buds in subterranean regions. Considering the microecologies this plant has been found in, one could surmise that it could be found in any cavern regardless of geographic region. Keywords. Tossing pigment into this flower results in the release of purple pigment seeds regardless of the color of the pigment tossed in. This variety of candy pop contains robustly odiferous oils. If candy pop flowers could be cultivated, there is no doubt that the plants would offer multifaceted benefits to the cosmetic, medical, and tourist industries. I bet they would. Ivory candy pop bud. Fora nivius. Candy pop family. Research from our most recent expedition has confirmed the presence of candy pop buds in subterranean regions. Considering the microecologies this plant has been found in, one could surmise that it could be found in any cavern regardless of geographic regions. Same message, key message, as the violet candy pop bud. Tossing pigment into this flower always produces white pigment seeds, regardless of the color of pigment tossed in. 
In many cases, plants with small leaves typically have limited photosynthetic capabilities and thus must find alternate means of attaining nutrients, with parasitic and predatory behavior being most common. The candy pop could be considered one such example. Queen candy pop bud, actually one of my favorites. Flora Regina, candy pop family. This specimen constantly changes colors. When pigment are thrown into it, it shoots out seeds that match the flower's coloration the moment the pigment landed inside of it. The number of seeds shot out is always greater than the number of pigment thrown in. It can be said that this is a completely baffling plant, and many mysteries remain over precisely what sort of relationship it has with the pigment. It would appear that the pigment gained all the benefit from the relationship. Perhaps it is simply a different variety of pigment to begin with? Who knows? Creeping Chrysanthemum. Yeah, I see you right there trying to hide and camouflage yourself. Terazacum rovinia. Chrysanthemum family. Like Pikmin, the creeping Chrysanthemum is a member of a group of creatures with ambulatory root structures. This creature is known as a mimic, but because it is actually a form of plant, this label is not entirely accurate. For unknown reasons, the creeping chrysanthemum's mimicry does not fool Pikmin, perhaps because they share a similar heritage. It relies on preying upon other creatures to provide sustenance, so it has no need of leaves for photosynthesis. Generally speaking, the role of plants within an ecosystem is as a producer species, and thus plants are generally found at the bottom of the food pyramid. However, on this strange planet, the line between producer plants and consumer plants is blurred. Interesting. Skitter leaves. Nice to see you guys are quiet. Russ Sudor begins. I have no idea how that's properly pronounced, I'm sorry. Skitterling family. The skitter leaf is a relative of the pond skater that shed its wings and adapted to life on the ground. With no residual traits of its airborne past, the skitter leaf can neither fly nor skit across the surface of the water. The wings have since evolved into the leaf-like structure on its back, which serves to hide the skitter leaf through mimicry. Another hiccup, I'm sorry. It appears quite effective as few predators can see through this clever disguise. Really? Then how is it even possible for me to see them? Unmarked spectrolites. Ooh, beautiful butterflies. Fenestari prismatis, glitter bee family. When strolling through the forests of this planet, clouds of these creatures are seen dancing overhead. Like flower petals drifting in the breeze, the sight of flitter bees, or flitter bees, no, I'm just gonna say flitter bees, dancing in the lush green undergrowth is unforgettable. Flitter bee collectors drool over specimen sample boxes lined up in order, highlighting the slight colored gradation changes from blue to red to yellow. Such items fetch particularly high prices at auction. Really? That's, uh, that's quite a rather fascinating and valuable pick of bugs in that case. I'm not really sure what to make of it, but anyways, moving on. Honey Wisp, Nectara Fatis. Sorry for calling you fat. Honey Wisp family. This floating life form drifts effortlessly on the winds. Upon death, its physical structure instantly collapses, and as the creature is particularly elusive and difficult to catch, no sample specimens have been acquired as of yet. If we could simply recover a live sample, research on this species would likely proceed more smoothly. Yeah, it is such a shame that we can't catch those guys. Mamuta. Unknown. Unknown family. Wow, that's... Quite a lot of starting material right there. The imbalance acer asit I'm having a hard time pronouncing this, I'm sorry. Asymmetrical arms of the Mamuta are among its most notable features. Feeding on seeds and fruit, the Mamuta is known to actually sow and grow plant species. While other species have exhibited seed bearing behavior for the purpose of storage, the Mamuta is the only species so far known to actually cultivate fields of plants. It should also be noted that whenever Pikmin fall victim to its slam, well, say for instance that they're their leaf and bud stages, if the Mamuta slam the Pikmin into the ground, they instantly become flowers. 
How that's possible, I don't know, but I find this creature to be quite miraculous in some situations, especially in the case when you want to quickly mature your Pikmin. Breadbug Pansara's Gluttonae Breadbug family The adult Breadbug competes for many of the same food sources as Pikmin, but its thick skin hide allows it to withstand most Pikmin group attacks. However, some researchers claim to have observed Breadbugs being overwhelmed by massive numbers of Pikmin and reduced to food. Huh, really? So, they're just scared. I find that rather disturbing. Pellet Posey, Amplus Nutrio, Pellet Weed Family. In the stem of the Pellet Posey, one can observe the muscle fiber unique to half plant, half animal species such as the Pikmin and Candy Pop flowers. So the Pellet Posey is a species that can be considered a close relative. Although the ability to crystallize nectar is unique to a small group of the Pellet Weed Family, the fact that these plants reach maturity so quickly and that their pellets contain such high concentrations of the natural nutrients in the soil explains why the Pikmin and so many of the other indigenous species are so reliant on these pellets for sustenance. If you guys hear some noise in the background, by the way, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on, but I have some people over here for the time being. Common Gold Cap Fungi Luminarium Gold Cap Family the light emitted from this rare mushroom is neither a reflection nor a release of stored light. It grows not only on decomposing trees, but also on soil and rocks. This mushroom's fungal filaments are capable of stabilizing and concentrating pure Hakotatium 111. It is none other than the Hakotatium 111 approaching the point of critical mass that causes the gold cap's blue luminescence. Hmm. I wonder. I wonder so many things about that plant, actually. Clover, Quatrius infectum, Clover family. This is a naturalized species. These plants are extremely persistent, and with the assistance of a symbiotic fungus that grows on its roots, the species is able to survive even in drought conditions. Typically, its leaves come in groupings of three, but intense impact on the leafing stem early in the development cycle can result in an extremely rare four-leaf cluster. It's pretty common in life. Usually on the grass we find three-leaf clovers, but in some instances, or well, rare instances, we can find four-leaf clovers. I, of course, have not found four-leaf clovers myself, only threes, but, you know, I would like to find a four-leaf clover someday. Figwort. Scrofularia zenomium, figwort family. This plant offers an excellent example of a non-native species introduced into the ecosystem by some unknown method. Upon introduction, it quickly established a foothold and adapted to the new habitat. This plant's distinct flowers usually exhibit a stunning blue color in early spring, but recent field work has recorded specimens displaying a deep red hue. Although this may represent a sudden deviation in genetics of the species, the red coloration is much more likely an anomaly. Additional readings suggest no significant atmospheric or solar radiation changes have occurred in the ecosystem, leaving open the possibility that soil composition and mineral deposits may have affected petal coloration. That's interesting. Dandelion Tarxacum officinale Dandelion family This perennial grows best in locations with full sun exposure, its flowers boast countless tiny yellow petals packed together in a head. The species seems to have as many wheat-like variants as petals, so more detailed research on these plants would best be left to a botanical research specialist. Seeding Dandelion I like these kind of dandelions, by the way. I like to pull them around in the summer. Tarxacum ventulus, Dandelion family it is believed that this plant produces tufted seeds with a parachute-like arm, which allows the seeds to ride gently on the wind. This increases the distribution range of the plant considerably. Next up, Horsetail. Equestrius vinico, Horsetail family. This variety of horsetail is prevalent in regions with low nutrient content in the soil. Unlike most other plants, this particular species propagates itself through the release of spores. Foxtail Vulpus cauda, foxtail family. This plant remains 
erect after withering and losing its color, so we can only hypothesize about the true color of the plant's plumage. However, local soil analysis indicates trace amounts of dormant seeds, making it not hard to imagine that the area was thick with these plants in the summer. I don't recall myself seeing foxtails, maybe I have, I, I don't really remember, but that's actually pretty fascinating. Glow stem. Nocturnica Illuminati. Gocat family. Take Illuminati what you will, by the way, guys. Although they are obviously unrelated, the glow stem bears a striking resemblance to the streetlights on Hakote, Hakotate. I'm sorry. It is highly possible that glow stems could be a relic of some unknown civilization beyond the scope of our imagination. Very fascinating. Margaret. Luminosus crocius, chrysanthema family, they look like sunflowers. This plant's delicate yellow flowers often inspire waves of nostalgia, giving a bittersweet feeling to any who gaze upon them. Bittersweet? That's weird because whenever I gaze at them, I just get a sense of nostalgia for some reason. It's pretty weird. Fiddlehead, Violinae orchestras fern family. At first glance, this plant resembles the spring used in the ship's sublight engine. Many of its most primitive characteristics remain intact, including its habit of spreading through the dispersal of spores. It seems as though that all plants just repropagate themselves through the means of spores. Shoot. That's exactly what it's called, guys. Unknown. Unknown family. This is a young shoot of some kind, but what kind of tree species does it belong to? I wonder that as well. What shape will it take when it matures and grows to full height? Unfortunately, we are only able to obtain information from our portable scanners on a select few of the countless number of species we've encountered. But even if our expedition yields only brief observations on the life we encounter, it will still provide a better understanding of this bizarre planet. And now we move on to the boss bugs. Yeah, sleep trite. Sleep trite? What is wrong with me? I definitely need a bottle of water after this. Sleep tight, Empress Boblax. There, that's what it means to say. Empress Boblax, Oculus Metriarcha, Grubdog family. Initial observations placed doubt on the capability of the Grubdog family to support a strong and or be like social structure, but recent studies show the family is capable of such complexity. The egg sac of the largest female grub dog within a given range swells to dramatic proportions in response to environmental changes, such as the sudden depletion of prey species. These females temporarily take on the role of pack matriarch. Also, in pack formation, it has been observed that nearly all males not involved in species reproduction undergo natural sex changes. Yeah, that's right, I said that word, guys. I said the word sex. But that's clearly mentioned in text as Take that what you will, guys. J just, just take that what you will. The characteristics of such specimens are quite intriguing indeed. Alright, next up, before I end up saying that word again. Burrowing Snagra. Oh my god, I hate you so much. Shiropedes and a Kondai. Will you please shut up? I know you have a lot of food right around you, but come on. There's no need to make all that noise to try to distract me. That's another reason why I hate you. Yeah, you just take your time on the ground. Shuripedes, Anacondae, Snavian family. The majority of Snagger species lie in wait to ambush and capture prey, with the body type perfectly adapted to such sudden strikes. It violently attacks small surface dwelling insects. Distributed across a relatively wide range, subspecies of Snaggerets suited to the varying soil conditions have emerged, making the Snaggeret the most geographically represented species besides the bulbor. Visually resembling the burrowing snagret is the burrowing snarrow, the range of which partially overlaps with the snagret's range. While the two may appear similar, when pulled from the ground, they can be distinguished by the presence or absence of tail and wing markings. Interesting. Hi there, beating long likes. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna ask you to not walk around. Okay, you could just keep walking around. Fine, we'll see if I care. See what I care about the amount of noise that you make. Beady long legs, pseudo arachnia, 
a Morales, Arachnor family. Will you please shut up? Although this creature is commonly associated with spiders, it is actually the result of a separate evolutionary line of insectoid creatures. Since the spherical body section, supported by the creature's legs, carries most of its internal organs, there appear to be no other features that would correspond to a head or abdomen. Yeah, you noticed that I wasn't distracted by you so much because I'm quite used to you. Although I will say, you gotta quiet down while I read. Thank you. Emperor Boblax. Oculus Supremus, Grub Dog Family. The largest member of the Grub Dog Family is normally found buried in the ground, with only the stalks of its eyes exposed. This camouflage allows the predator to surprise smaller creatures and use its long, adhesive tongue to capture prey. The thick hide and angular hump give the organism a distinct rock like quality. During the rainy season, moss grows freely on its hump making it nearly impossible to distinguish this lethal predator from a stone. I don't know, I mean, it's not really that hard to distinguish between the two, between an Emperor Boblax and a stone. Of course, that's in my opinion, but creatures on the other hand, that could be a different story. Giant Breadbug, Panzaris Gigantus, Breadbug Family. This gargantuan species of the greater Breadbug family has a torso so perfectly square that it almost seems like it was formed in a mold. For a brief period after birth, the giant breadbug competes for food with smaller breadbugs, but upon reaching maturity, it seeks out much larger prey. This is the primary reason that two species with similar feeding habits can coexist in the same habitat. Hordes of Pikmin appear to pose the only possible threat to this massive creature's life. Yeah, considering that it doesn't do any attacking itself, I can see why that is. Oh my god, I hit you worse than the burrowing snagret. Heliated snagret. Shut up, I'm trying to read. Shiropedes ambulatria. Thank you. Snavian family. This variety of snagret has the ability to both burrow underground and walk above it. Its earthy red coloration and distinct yellow ear and eye markings make it immediately recognizable. Yeah, I did read that correctly. Despite featuring a ch chimera-like merging of serpent and avian features, the pileated, sn pileated snagret has poor eyesight for a bird, perhaps due to extended periods spent underground. To compensate for this, its nose features a thermal sensing organ commonly to many snakes, making it a dangerously effective hunter. It is rather dangerous, I'll be honest. Manic legs. Okay, good. This one isn't going to be walking around. That is, unless I disturb it. Which I'm not going to. Pseudoarachnia navaronia, arachnor family. This species of the arachnor family fuses with machinery at a crucial point in the maturation process, giving it the ability to fire energy bursts from the launcher beneath its orbular torso. Can I just say, by the way, guys, that I find it rather interesting how this creature is able to acquire that kind of technology. What kind of technology is it, and where does it get it from? Again, it's a mystery. However, the man at legs itself is not in control of this weapon. Oh, it isn't? Instead, the mechanical portions of its structure appear to automatically acquire and attack targets. The man at legs has a gentle disposition, and as a member of the arachnor species, it has no natural enemies. It is particularly difficult to understand why the species would develop such awesome offensive capabilities, leading to rumors among the scientific community that it was the machinery that approached the arachnor and proposed a symbiotic relationship. Wow, really? So, it was basically a machine that made it hostile. And naturally, the creature has no enemies, therefore it comes in peace. That's so weird. Like, how is it that machinery is able to influence a bug to target such other small predators? I have no idea. This whole entire planet's a mystery. Ranging Bloister, Mollusca Predatoria, Mollusking Family. This species of mollusk has shed its shell through the process of evolution. What appears as a flower shaped protrusion on its back actually functions as its gills. The ranging bloister ensnares small animals with its sticky tentacles, reels them in, and consumes them. Observers have noted that this creature exhibits a keen interest in flashing objects. 
It often tries to capture and ingest these objects. Researchers and explorers equipped with flashing identification beacons should be wary when in close proximity to this dangerous predator. That is true, it does favor spacesuits more than anything else, especially the lights that they give off. Water Wave, oh my god. You're just never gonna shut up, aren't you? Water Wraith, Amphibio Sapiens, Unknown Family, will you please carry your rolling elsewhere? All that is known about this creature stems from a few sightings deep underground. All reported sightings feature the same core set of details, a gigantic viscous form with a clear, hazy sheen, not unlike hard candy. Can I just say, by the way, guys, that the creature got very close to the camera, and if it damaged the camera, then that would have been bad. That's why I was distracted by it momentarily. One theory holds that it may be the ectoplasmic incarnation of a kind of psychic phenomenon, but as is usually the case with such theories, it is very difficult to prove. All witnesses report being suddenly overcome with fear upon sighting the creature, approaching a state of panic and near insanity. That has happened to me, by the way. Whenever I encountered that creature in the submerged castle during my no death run of Pikmin 2, I was indeed scared and driven to the point of insanity. In fact, every report contains an inordinate amount of extremely vague details, which has led to suspicions that exhaustion and fear have caused some simple natural phenomenon to be viewed as a living creature. So it's a combination of both exhaustion and fear. Or am I looking at this wrong? I just don't get it. Segmented Cropster. Parastechoidea reptantia. Creepcrab family. This gigantic beast is wrapped in a hard shell. In an atypical evolution, the right front leg of this creature is hypertrophic, taking on the function of an arm rather than a leg. That's disturbing. Its asymmetric physical development is unique in the natural world. One unlucky explorer's incorrect conclusion that this creature adheres to a pattern of peaceful, quiet behavior led to an unfortunate incident. When was that actually? Was that during the Cavern of Chaos? I mean, I myself knew that the creature was dangerous. Maybe Almar and the President didn't know about that at first? In fact, this beast exhibits intensely hostile, aggressive tendencies, aiming at prey and ramming them at full speed. It pretty much just rolls itself around. Almost like Sonic, but it doesn't move as fast. Raging Long Legs, oh my god, really? Another one? Pseudoarachnia furiendis. Arachnor family, stop your walking! I'm trying to read. Arachnorps boasts a wondrous biological composition with a silicon-based exoskeleton and innards coated with malleable heavy metals. You're not going to stop walking, by the way? Fine, I'll just ignore you. However, much about these creatures remains a mystery as specimens regularly explode when they are dissected. These explosions produce scorching flames that completely melt all internal organs, leaving us with a disappointing lack of information on the inner workings of the species. We must await the development of new dissection processes and more specialized research before we can better understand this enigmatic creature. However, the following observation notes have been recorded. Appears to be lovely terrain for some unknown purpose. Location of eyes and ears not readily apparent. Freezing a specimen may yield new research opportunities. We could do that. But then again, it would be too huge to carry back. And finally... Titan Dweevil. Mandarachnia gargantium, Dweevil family. Will you stop moving for a second? The largest member of the Dweevil family, this fearsome predator carries protective components that frequently exhibit offensive capabilities, an evolution that may be attributed to mere chance. Another evolutionary theory is that the chemical contents of the containers carried by Titan Dweevils contribute to possible gene splicing. While other Dweevils do not seem to choose the objects they carry, the Titan Dweevil appears to prefer shiny objects above all others. That explains why it carried those four treasures along with Louie. And with that guys, that does it for the first segment of the Pikmin 2 bonus series. The one in which we cover all Mars notes on the enemies. We definitely found out a lot more interesting things about the bugs themselves as well as the local plants. 
Now sure I did have some distractions here and there. There are so many mysteries wrapped around this planet, if I'll be honest with you guys. Mysteries in which I wish that they could be answered sooner, but um... Yeah, I guess for the time being, they'll just remain a mystery, but they are rather interesting. Anyway, that does it for this part of the Pikmin 2 bonus series, and in the next part, we're going to take a look at Louie's notes on all the enemy bugs and plants. So, thank you guys so much for watching. Wait, hold on. Let me just make these quiet. No, you're still making noise. There we go, that's much better. Peace and quiet. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Hit that like button down below if you did. I'm Multigame Master one and I will see you guys in the next video. Game on, everyone. See you later.